the alt-right and i truly don't think there's anyone on the internet that is more hated by the alt-right than me yeah but i mean like, that's truly. true that's true of everybody <laughs> so for instance like uh lefties are always like um you know i'm a certain kind of leftist and then like the lefty there's nothing that lefties hate more than a slightly different kind of leftist so that's like that's not that's not as good of a defense as you want it to be <laughs> <laughs> well no no they uh they think i'm a race traitor whore mm. <laughs> well uh... so but but see that's the so this is the real question so what are you because are you are you trad con now or <laughs> no you i'm definitely not are you christian conservative are you social I am a christian and are i am a you, conservative are you yes. economic conservative fiscal conservative Oh, well, well, we can get into that. Okay. But, um, all right. All right. All right. That's yeah. 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 I, I we, figured. We get into I figured that. since it's just uh, if it's just us, that actually takes some of the peanut gallery pressure off of it, so we can yes. kind of go wherever we want to go, which is actually that that's actually more fun for me because I fucking I hate the peanut gallery. So oh, they are. Oh, sorry. That was an f bomb. My bad. Um. Nope. Yeah. Um. All right. Where? Okay. I'm just gonna start the introduction. If you're recording on OBS. Sure. Yep. Ready to go. Hey everyone, and welcome back to my channel. I hope you had a great holiday, great new year, and oh my goodness, 2021 is looking like 2020 on crack. So that's great, but uh, hopefully we can bring a bit of sanity to everything going on because today I have brought counterpoints or Connor. He was the police officer that discussed issues of PTSD, um, all sorts of challenges police face in the field in my latest film, Crossfire. Uh, Connor, it is excellent to have you here. Is there anything you want to add to your introduction, a bit of a background about yourself? Sure, yeah. Um, so li like you said, my name's Connor. I, I do run a YouTube channel named Counterpoints. So if you want to check that out, that'd be super cool. Um, I do consider myself kind of like an enlightened centrist or whatever the meme is these days. Oh, that's not going to go over well. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. I am I am ready. Do you, do you know what that means? That means that I punch left and then lefties scream at me and then I punch right and then right wing people scream at me. So that's kind of, uh, that's what I signed up for. So it, it is what it is. <laughs> But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a former Marine. I did serve four years in the military between 2006 and 2010. Um, I did, um, I, I also got my four-year degree in Central Florida, and then I served four years as a cop in Central Florida, in a suburb of Central Florida. And I did three years on patrol, one year in the schools. I do have a decent amount of stories that I think are fairly interesting, which is part of the reason why I jumped onto the YouTube sphere so I could throw elbows with a bunch of smart people and get screamed at because I guess I'm a masochist. So that's... Kind of. Do you think there is this disconnect between people who have read a lot of books on subjects and people who have lived these subjects but have no context in which to interpret their experiences because they haven't read any of the literature on it? And I wish those two could mesh a little more. So I think that's actually an excellent thing that you're doing uh, coming into this sphere. Now, the first question I wanted to put to you, what did you make of the Crossfire movie? Well, so I, I really enjoyed, um, I, I would say prob probably a decent chunk of it, um, especially the, the cop segments I feel are really strong. Um, so, so I think that everybody who was involved in that project, everybody, um, including me would, would be fine basically with what was represented in the, in the messages that were represented, especially in the cop sections. It's, uh, basically it is a tough job. You're, you're danged or damned if you do and damned if you don't. Um, there, there's a psychological and a physical toll that, uh, accumulates for law enforcement officers that often doesn't get acknowledged. And oftentimes a lot of these like systemic issues that the, the left talks about, it, it's not just a, it, it's kind of like a prisoner's dilemma almost where, you know, the, some of the toxic aspects of law enforcement or the toxic aspects of communities or the toxic aspects of American history, they all compound into this problem that we're trapped in and uh, it really does hurt everybody. And that's kind of why, um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping at the very least, uh, Crossfire is a way to present um, a variety of perspectives, the conservative take on the issue, and then kind of start a conversation right there. Yeah, for sure. And I do, like, obviously, I would admit my projects do lean more conservative, for sure. But the mm. reason I do that, and I hope you'd agree with this, is I think there is just an 
overwhelming amount of leftist analysis of these situations in media, and you don't too often hear the conservative side. Even as an enlightened centrist, can you accept that? <laughs> I can. Uh, but the the thing that I think, um, and we'll, we'll get into this a little bit later, especially when we start talking about like opportunities, where do we go from here, especially with like how toxic society is right now uh, with this course. And even, you know, like we're, we're in the wake of the Capitol Hill riots and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what what I want to do, um, what I want to focus on is is not this like factionalism of, hey, you know, these guys are bad and they're evil and they're stupid and they're going to take over and we need to destroy them and all that kind of stuff. I think that's how we got here effectively. Um, so what I'm interested in is not so much. So, for instance, you were talking about the overrepresentation of leftist ideas or left. Uh, and I'm reading into it or inferring some stuff, but like left uh, lefty hypocrisy. Um, I'm interested in calling that out. But I'm also also interested in finding the strongest parts of reform and compromise that actually have bipartisan support and then focusing on that as a conversation. So I, I've literally I'll shut up in a second, um, but I literally go on to debate panels all the time and I present some ideas and lefties love me for like 30 seconds. Then I say something wrong and then I'm an evil Nazi uh, piece of shit. And then I go into right wing panels and I present a whole bunch of ideas that they like. And then I say something wrong and then I'm a commie, traitor, lefty piece of shit. So it's all that that's the bridge that I want to fix. And that was well, part I, of my participation. We will talk about this a little later because I want to get to the Capitol uh, riot stuff first. Mm -hmm. But I will say I do think there are people who would just say it, we're beyond that you know censorship has gotten to a point where the other side doesn't even want to have a conversation some of them are saying they want to see us dead they've labeled us as nazis which essentially means you deserve to be killed shot defeated and stamped out no matter what mm -hmm. and therefore any option of th that option of trying to find middle ground will just be giving them more and more and more ground but we will get to that conversation i'm just going to put that there so that uh people that are watching don't feel like that uh, that's gonna oh be i will i will fight your commenters we will get into it <laughs> <laughs> but so we we have entered and this is really a big portion of what i want to focus on in this interview we have mm. entered a very interesting moment in time for policing we had a year of people saying back the blue and other people saying a cab we need to get rid of the policing systems demoralization of police officers uh you know some politicians fighting for them but not a whole lot but you still had this faction of america that were saying no we need law and order we need the blue we need these people that keep our communities safe and that seems to have dissipated or at least maybe even reversed we have seen videos coming out of people literally beating police officers with thin blue line flags uh, you had the Capitol Hill riots where you just had mega people completely fed up. Uh, they, they, it seems that political violence has become the new language in America. You have a year of media politicians and activists and celebrities saying rioting is okay. And personally, I think it was just inevitable that the other side is going to say, well, they're being rewarded for it socially and even in policy. We're going to start doing it too. And that is not to say it's okay. That's just what I think the natural course of human observation would lead to seeing this for a year. Um, but what has resulted is now, yeah, just a bipartisan kind of anti-police sentiment in America. The people who said, we backed the blue for a year, you still kind of gave in and changed policies for BLM. You guys went and kneeled with them. You supported them and didn't support the people who were trying to back the blue. When we've done protest movements to support you, you came and policed us and did, uh, you know, brought in the riot squad against us. So what what do you make of this bipartisan anti-police sentiment in America and where do you think it's going to lead? Well, I, I think this is actually this is this is actually fundamental to the conversation because you kind of you brought up you brought up a point and then we we got here. Right. So so the point being that um, on the conservative side and definitely on the lefty side or whatever, there's this feeling or this thought um, that we can't actually have discourse, that the, these problems are insurmountable. We can't have uh, we can't concede because if we concede any ground, then the other side wins. And this this is effectively recipe for a civil war. That's what it is. When when you I think it's Jordan Peterson who says uh, big fan, by the way, um, Jordan Peterson, who says uh, basically like, what, you know, what do you call somebody you can't talk to? You call them an enemy. And, and this is uh, effectively where 
curve. That's the logical extension of where that line of thinking goes if you think discourse is impossible. And I, I mentioned this to you previously um, in a different conversation, but you basically have to have an iron fist inside a velvet glove, which is you are always reaching out diplomatically. You're always looking out for the solution. You're always looking out for the compromise, but then on things that you can't compromise, you basically crush. And, and that that's actually the, I, I, am, I am a true, I am a Republican in the sense that I believe in the Republic. I believe that there are laws that we establish for the good order of humanity that these laws have to be followed by every single person and anybody who disobeys that deserves to be crushed. So again, I'm going to piss off your audience. Feel free to hate subscribe to my channel. But basically, uh, the, there's a saying in law enforcement that uh, jail is like Disneyland. Anybody can go. And what that means is it doesn't matter if you're a 16 year old DUI, you know, white girl from the upper middle class. It doesn't matter if you're a, a, a hooded, you know, drug dealer who has killed five people. It doesn't matter. Everybody can go to jail. So conservatives are not above this. Progressives are not above this. Lefty Antifa. Nobody's above I, this shit. I don't think my audience will hate you for that, nor do I think <laughs> they will disagree with you for that. Well, I, in fact, um, <laughs> no, I think hopefully, I think there are a lot more hopefully. reasonable people in my audience than you than you think there are. Yeah. But I will ask there: at what point do you stop? Like, how many times do you have to have your hand slapped away mm -hmm. when you try to reach out for reasonable conversation and discourse? And not just slapped away, but chopped off, scratched, punched. Like, how many times do you have to have that happen before you say? I'm just, this is like, I'm a sucker for punishment because this is, I feel like this has been the last uh, five years of, oh, let's do a debate at Berkeley. Oh no, Antifa shut it down and set the town ablaze. Oh, mm -hmm. let's do a, yeah, let's do a debate on YouTube channel. Oh no, now they're going to just a platform anyone who has uh, right-wing opinions. Let's have conversation on Twitter. Oh no, now they're just going to ban anyone that that says, so Twitter, like, you know, they've said, uh, we want to ban people that are going to start riots and that are going to start political violence. Mm -hmm. But Jack Dorsey donated $3 million to Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and allowed people who like uh, Kaepernick, who said we need more rioting, we need more protest. He supported that. Well, Donald Trump calls for people to go home and go in peace. I'm not saying there was no, hey, let's go out there, hoorah, that happened beforehand, but no different than any of these lefty politicians. Uh, and he gets banned from every social media platform. So as a conservative, you look at that and say, actually, for five years, I have wanted to speak. I have wanted to talk. I have wanted to have a reasonable debate. And at every turn, my hand has been slapped away. If we keep trying to do this while they keep moving forward and punching us, we're just going to disappear. They're going like hard power is going to trump soft power. This kindness, it, it almost gets to a point of, you know, don't throw pearls before swine. That's mm -hmm. literally biblical principle. Don't be a fool and just keep trying to reason with people who have no interest in it. And I'm not saying there aren't lefties who don't have interest, who I'm not saying it's all lefties. I have friends that are lefties. I have great conversations with, but it's certainly the ones in power. And those are the ones you have to be afraid of because they're the mm -hmm. ones that can completely change your life, your freedoms, your rights. And that's the point that conservatives are at. I really like your mood that you have, but I just feel it might be naive that's towards okay. the actual that's, situation. No, that that's okay. And I am I am literally, one of the things that I've said in the past is that we have to be, and, and by this, I'm, I'm talking about people who follow me and like me and, and myself, we have to be willing to be thought of as naive. And I, I'm going to throw some biblical principle back at you. Um, and, and I'm also going to say, as me, you're, you're asking, how many times do we turn the other cheek? How many times do we take the hit? Mm. As many times as it takes. And this is not this is not to concede. This is not to, to concede your principles. This is not to say, um, you know, basically strong American families don't matter. This isn't to say that there aren't benefits to capitalism. This isn't to say that law enforcement serves a societal purpose. This isn't to say that a lot of conservative values are worth fighting for on the public stage and fighting for earnestly and honestly and advancing uh, what's worth conserving in the conservative movement. That is all stuff worth fighting for. But at the same same time, you know, you're asking how many times can somebody be an asshole to me uh, before I before I start being an asshole? And the answer is be asshole. Sorry for swearing so much, but be a jerk. This is this is the fundamental reciprocity, which is basically be a jerk 
to people who are being jerks to you and be nice to the people who are being nice to you. And you mentioned yourself that you have a whole bunch of lefty friends who you could have reasonable conversations with about, um, you know, compromising positions or this is the way that I view society or this is where I want to push and like all that kind of stuff. It is, uh, I'm going to push you into the uh, centristy camp. It is your job, your job and my job as a conservative to communicate the lefty and progressive ideals that are worth communicating in a steel man fashion to right-wing audiences. And it is your job to communicate the strong parts of conservatives, uh, cons this conservative movement to the left wing in a steel man fashion. And that is fundamental to discourse. Okay. Yes, I agree with all of that in a perfect world. What happens when you no longer have the ability to have any discourse at all? When your channel's taken down, when you're taken out of proper society, you're not allowed to use MasterCard, you're not allowed to start a site to compete with Twitter that you've been taken off of because Parler gets taken off every app store. Um, what what happens? Because this is, this is what the theory has been. When you take away people's ability to have peaceful revolution, peaceful conversation, you make mm. violence inevitable. And that that's the question I think a lot of people have. What happens when we no longer actually have the ability to have conversation so, anymore? Where, so where's the, me, where do we go from there? So let, let me, let me add, well, fundamentally the answer is violence. That that's the answer <laughs> that you're pushing at. You're put, you're pushing that. At civil I don't war. want that. I'm just saying that's oh, what. Oh, don't worry about the terms of service, Lauren. We'll be fine. We're talking about. I don't, I don't want a civil war. Quite <laughs> genuinely. I, that's horrible. Violence. Okay. Is horrible. Okay. War so, hell. okay. So let, let's, so let's pause on the violence. Violence is horrible stuff. And let's say that we, th th this is a lefty talking point. This is a steel man talking point. Um, that violence is inherent to society. Regardless of whether or not you want to admit it, police inflict violence on criminals. Whether or not you want to admit it, Border Patrol inflicts violence on people who are trying to immigrate illegally. Whether or not you want to admit it, uh, the U.S. military across the globe inflicts violence on people in the name of American global hegemony. Now, whether or not that's good or bad is a different conversation. Violence mm -hmm. in a vacuum um, can be, I don't want to say good, but it can be necessary. It can be a necessary evil in the world. So we kind of we have to move past this like, um, you know, naivete, and like, I'm not calling you naive, but I'm just saying like no, this no, naivete that's, that's that like v avoid violence at all costs. Well, I would never avoid violence at all costs. So for instance, Muslim Uyghurs in, in Western China, they shouldn't avoid violence at all costs. They're literally being, you know, culturally genocided by the by an authoritarian government. Conservatives mm -hmm. in America shouldn't uh, avoid violence at all costs because if we saw a 1973 style Chinese cultural revolution where capitalists and conservatives are being dragged out of their house and beaten to death by young college students, then of course not. Violence is in the game, but it is not too late right now. Discourse mm -hmm. is still possible. We are capable of talking to each other and. Th this is this is the thing. So I mean, maybe maybe your audience doesn't want to hear it, but the thing about it is, there's real things that the left has to offer to culture that is not um, not a straw man. Okay. So for instance, let, let, let's just talk. Let's just talk about a, a hot button issue. Okay. White privilege. Yeah. Okay. So the straw man of it is that you're white. I'm white. Through nature of our birth, we're privileged. And you know, basically, the conservative extension is that this is an unearned privilege and therefore I'm a piece of shit and I deserve to be attacked. And there are people on Twitter who will confirm that bias. However, if you take the steel man of that version, which is if you had a choice to be black or white in American society, which would you pick and why? And we have this structure of egalitarianism that we're all supposedly committed to in a, in a liberal egalitarian republic but it's not quite there. And even if we think it's there, like conservatives like Ben Shapiro insist that all our institutions are no longer racist. Um, they insist that all our institutions have been, like in 1964, racism was banned and everything was perfect after that. Like, like, like that's kind of like the straw man of that argument, but it's not true. And even if it was true, that's not how black Americans feel. So kind of if we were to extend charity and humanity and Christian empathy to somebody who is saying, I am hurting, society does not treat me correctly. You can talk about perverse incentives, cultural traditions that are toxic, fucking, uh, you know, uh, anti-authority or anti-authority fucking toxic shit. You can talk about all that shit. But you also need to talk about the historical things where we have screwed up as a society. America is not, 
inherently perfect. We didn't make every single choice right at every single moment in history. And these things all have intergenerational consequences that we are capable of talking about. I so you obviously you watched Crossfire and in Crossfire we do whole segments talking about the problems with racism in the past, the civil rights movements, slavery. We don't shy away from that because you don't have to shy away from that conversation to admit that points that Black Lives Matter make today are not necessarily accurate or based on fact. I completely agree with that. Mm. And um yeah, I, I don't think those things are mutually exclusive. You you have to have those as separate conversations. I do have trouble with your interpretation of white privilege, and that's because I have never even heard it described that way in an academic context. In my mm -hmm. high school, white privilege was you're white, you're non-white, go to that side of the locker, go to the other side of the locker. You're white, you're inherently privileged. And you talk about generational consequences. And once again, I can't take it away from my own individual experience, you know, being having a grandmother who was an orphan who had to travel all over the world, escaping abusive homes and lived homeless hitchhiking across Canada in trailer parks where, you know, I'd a family of mine have to dumpster dive for food. And I have to think, oh, like, does that not have generational consequences, trauma and things in my life that go completely ignored because people see my skin color? Mm -hmm. I agree that there is a conversation to have there. Of course, if you are white in a Western country, you're probably going to be far more likely to be someone that was, and this is only a very small percentage of the populace, but to be born into a family that perhaps had generational or historical wealth. But that is not all. Like, of course, you're going to be more likely to have that chance than someone who is born into a black family, because historically they wouldn't have been some of the royalty, the founders of the nation, the people who have been there a long time and were far more likely to be brought over by slavery. But it just the the there is never I, I rarely this is maybe the only time in a debate or a conversation I've had about this where I've seen such a generous definition of white privilege. Sure. It is almost always just hammered at you as an attack to make your opinion irrelevant, to deny your life experience and the potential for it to be misused in conversation and to be twisted towards people who have genuinely had difficult pasts of all different ethnic backgrounds is just that's just the reality that is how it is realistically used in society i don't see it being used generously um and once again it just doesn't take account for nuances the irish they're white but i don't think they they have this mad privileged background oh that i'm come from, you know? i'm irish i'm irish I, I think i think this is or ethnically anyways um so this is this is why i think i'm so sympathetic to some of these arguments because a hundred years ago my people were thought of as you know stone age barbarians who had 12 kids who were loyal to the pope who were gonna destroy america through their mass immigration um who were who were gonna you know change the language and you know rape and kill everybody and fight everybody i think that's the reason why i'm sympathetic to um uh, central american and South American immigrants. I think that's why I'm sympathetic to black people is because my people, like I, I hope through this conversation and through other conversations, I'm demonstrating that I'm a relatively intelligent person, um, but my humanity would have been discounted or my humanity would have so been- So then how can you accept this notion of white privilege? Why because wouldn't it's not it just discounting be privileged? And, no, no, but why does it have to be about white people? Why can't it just be privileged and not privileged? Why can't oh, we apply a, but it to they, people but as they- let, let, let me address it because I, I want to address- I think there's two real big points that I think are pertinent to this conversation. So, so number one, you you brought up your your personal history. You brought up how your you know your grandparents you know dumpster dived and you know kind of the, the economic privilege that would typically be associated with white people or whiteness or whatever is not present in your family. You didn't come across on the Mayflower. You didn't own you know what ten thousand acres of land with five hundred black slaves. Like your family are literally like nineteenth century immigrants who were dumpster diving in order to survive. Right? Okay. Yeah. So so that's fine. Um, that is a different, like, like so to steal man inter intersectionality as best I can, um, that is a different form of privilege, which is basically economic. And here, here's actually, here's something that uh, Chris Rock said that I think is really funny. He said, no white man in America would trade places with me because I, it, like, even though I'm rich. And I think that's bullshit. Because like I would happily trade, like I would happily trade places with Idris Elba or um, I'm trying to think of like another uh, black gentleman. Uh, Idris, uh, let's just say I would trade lives with Idris Elba because 
He might be black, but he's handsome and he's rich. So there, there, oh, uh, Wesley Snipes is another example. I would happily trade lives with that guy, even though he's black, but that doesn't mean that he's immune. So, so he's rich and he's handsome, which comes with a lot of societal privileges that might negate or overcome his racial position in the, you know, the what, whatever you want to call it, CRT, critical race theory, uh, uh, intersectionality, whatever. So he has privileges that might overcome his racial privilege. Um, but at the same time, like, uh, that doesn't mean that he's immune to walking down the street, some white, you know, person not recognizing that he is Wesley Snipes or Idris Elba and just using the N word and him, it, it fucking up his whole day because he has a history where he was very likely impressed into service. He, he was kidnapped by people from West Africa, uh, probably people who looked a lot like him, sold into slavery, and then became a part of the Anglo world. And you can't tell me that that history doesn't fuck with your head. Like if, if, being, if your mom being Ukrainian and dumpster diving and fucking surviving, if that affects the way that you perceive the world, you can't tell me that like slavery and histor uh, history there doesn't fuck, like, like can't fuck with a black person in the modern context. One more I'm point and then I promise I'll shut that. up. Okay, One more ahead. point I, and then I promise I'll <laughs> shut up. Um, Dave Chappelle is, said a phenomenal quote, and I'm going to keep saying this until I fucking die. Dave Chappelle said, your pain does not exclude my pain, and my pain does not exclude your pain. Just because your family has a fucked up history, came across as 19th century immigrants, they didn't have a fucking nickel to their name, and now they've bootstrapped into success... That's awesome. But that doesn't discount the fact that disproportionately black people are living fucked up lives inside America. But I agree with that statement exactly. And that's why I disagree with you on white privilege, because your pain does not negate my pain. And we all have a story that's unique. And maybe it's unique to your race. Maybe it's unique to being Irish. Maybe it's unique to being African-American. Maybe it's unique to, you know, my history uh, with, with uh, my grandmother being an orphan. Everyone has a story. And your race, your gender, whatever, does not negate the other person's story. And to talk about white privilege, I almost exclusively seen it as a way to negate someone else's story and say, my story is more important than yours right now. I had an argument with someone on Twitter the other day who was saying, that's uh, your first mistake, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> very, very true. Everyone on Twitter needs to, needs to go to therapy, everyone. <laughs> but um, he was say, saying the reason we say black lives matter and make it specifically about black people is because right now we're the ones with the problems. My house is the one on fire and it's basically like the fire engines are going by and you're screaming, no, come to my house, come to my house when I'm the one who has the house that's on fire. No, no, no. We need to make sure the fire engines go to the house on fire. And I read that and was kind of like, actually, no, the situation is both of our houses on are on fire. And you're saying only come to my house, ignore the other house on fire. Because uh, can we can we both agree? Whites are shot by police. Latinos are shot by police. Uh, Asians almost never, but I'm sure they are shot by police as well. Blacks are shot by police. This is a I, this is what makes me so frustrated too, is I look at the left and I see things they talk about and I agree with them on some of the problems. I'm like, we need to deal with this. You know, poverty, the government is going off and spending all of our money in foreign lands when they could put that, or foreign wars that don't involve us, when we could put that into uh, some sort of healthcare system to help people. I don't even completely disagree with that. I think the healthcare system here in Australia has been phenomenal, but Instead, you have to make it a race problem. You have to make it, it's about black people and not about white people. Why don't, I, I saw, I, maybe you saw a phenomenal Tucker Carlson monologue where he was talking about, actually the bigger problem is one of class. One of, you have a class of people that are crony capital, capitalists. They have the government supporting them. They're all only intermingling with each other. They are making laws and rules to only benefit the other people in the little, little social circles and governments. And the rest of us are being left behind. They're making these deals for millions of dollars to buy foreign jets. Well, we're getting $600 for the average person in what is supposed to be a COVID relief bill. If the left made it more about, actually, we're all in this together. This is a white and black problem. We all face these issues. I feel like you would have way more people 
uh, sympathizing and being able to have a conversation. But anyone, when they are discriminated against because of their race, reasonably rejects the person who discriminates against them because of their race. And I've seen so many people that are genuinely quite leftist that have totally backed away from the movement. I had a girlfriend from high school contact me and she's like, my employer just said they have to cut my hours because they want less white people on shift. She's like, this is madness. Oh, what? It's I, I genuinely think the left have done themselves no favors by making this a race. Thing. There, there's probably three things going on here. Okay, so so number one, maybe this this is my naivete, but I, I live in the United States of America. I am sorry that you live in the Commonwealth. I am sorry you live in like the Euro cucked, uh, you know, whatever's going on with with you guys. Um, so so basically, like, I will admit that the progressive policies are probably most advanced in European and Commonwealth societies. There seems to be a decent pushback in America, but I can't. Um, okay. So, so hold on. So I just admitted that you were Euro cucked. What was my next point? Okay. So my next point is if your friend, if your friend literally got their hours reduced because of her race, that's disgusting. It needs to be called out. It needs to be fought. Okay. But there, there's this other portion of this, which I lost. So I'm going to shut up. <laughs> but the, but, but the, the point basically being that it's like, okay, so I'm not, at, oh, okay, okay, I got it. So you basically made what's called a class reductionist argument. It, it, it's basically the fact that like, you know, we shouldn't worry about intersectionality. We shouldn't worry about the problems of trans people. We shouldn't worry about the problems of gay people or the problems of black people. Unique to their individual racial or sexual or gendered situation we should have a broad scope solution that incorporates everybody. And that's good from like a, a, a certain like political pragmatism stance, which, which is super awesome. But that being said, that's not to say that there aren't unique situations. So for instance, do black people have the same problems as white people? Not completely. Do trans people have the same problem as cis people? No. Fuck no. I'm not taking, I'm not taking T. I'm not taking E. I'm not, uh, you know, considering, um, you know, basically surgeries in order to change my body to help out with a psychological condition. Do gay people have certain problems that affect them uniquely? Absolutely. Absolutely. There, there's actually an entire um, subculture to homosexuality that Milo Yiannopoulos alluded to specifically before he was canceled, where where maybe the sexual norms of like cis het, heteronormative society are not the same things that are followed in the party scene in, in the homosexual subculture. So what I would be more interested in, rather than this like uh, class reductionist argument of like, oh, we're all the same, let's all fight together for the same thing. I would be interested in having conversations about that. Because the thing is, we can have more than one conversation at once. We can have more more than one problem at once. So we can talk about what it's like, what sucks about being black in America? What sucks about being gay in America? What sucks about being trans in America? And what sucks about being white and straight in America? I could make a fucking, I could make a, a fucking two hour video about that, about how women expect me to always take out the trash, about how women fucking expect me to do all the gross, bloody, nasty shit. We could talk about how uh, basically like I'm expected to be tough. I'm not allowed to talk about my emotions. I'm not allowed to be emotional. And these are all things that I'm, I'm trying to say. It's like, your pain does not exclude my pain and we can have multiple conversations at once. So why don't we have those conversations? Why don't we treat each other with charitably? And when somebody slaps me in the face or somebody spits in my face, I say, fuck you. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. And then I'll go talk to the person who actually is interested in talking to me in some level of charitable way. Love that. Really cool. We'd love to have all these discussions. I think they are all valid discussions. Do you think I could go to a university campus and say, I want to have a conversation about how it sucks to be white and male in America? Sure. <laughs> People sure. have literally done this where they have tried to kind of address the uh, bias where you have different groups in universities to help every single, I mean, when I was in university, they had the uh, you know, the gay Alliance, the LGBTQ room, they had the, um, uh, obviously the African group that met up and they all talked about their history and their different struggles, the Asian student Alliance, all these different groups. If you even thought to start a white student union, which people have done, you would get like, you'd literally make the news. People would be yeah. like, these kids need to be canceled. They need to never get jobs. They, you can't, this is the problem. You are assuming there is a fair and open panel for everyone to have those conversations. And perhaps 
people would care more about having all the rest of those conversations if they were also allowed to have a voice as well, but they aren't sure. there. I mean, we've seen videos come out of classrooms where it's like, no, no, white student can't talk. We're not hearing anyone, but the white kids can raise their hands and join this conversation. That's crazy. And that's why I think you see conservatives so strongly saying, no, 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 we have to address this problem first, where we literally have, like some groups may feel they don't have their problems being talked about enough. They may feel they have issues in society that uh, really need to be addressed. But right now there is a large group of society, conservatives and uh, white students that literally aren't allowed to have a voice and will get canceled and kicked out of classrooms if they try to talk about their problems or questions that they have. So let's talk about the people that are being pushed down rather than the people who are maybe in a neutral position or being pushed up in conversation. I'm not saying that they're being pushed down in every aspect of life, just when it comes to what I think is the most important part of political healing, which is actually being able to talk to each other and bring up your issues. That's sure. what they say with all relationships, marriage counseling, anything, communication, you know, and when we have lost the ability, it's like if you were to go to a counseling session and they were like, only your wife is allowed to speak. Uh, no, 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 no. You don't have problems, sir. You don't have concerns with the marriage. Only the wife is allowed to speak. Sure. Very but, unhealthy dynamic. Uh, uh, okay. Concede. All right. I'll just concede that that's a very unhealthy dynamic. But you can't tell me that you can't use the logic of privilege or critical race theory or toxic masculinity, or patriarchy, or all the all these fucking lefty memes in order to construct a steel man argument. And you can't tell me that we couldn't create a movement or, or, or a space where basically it's like, hey, we don't understand each other. Conservatives literally don't understand the left at all. Liberals and progressives don't understand conservatives at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a white dude who's a conservative, a white dude, or uh, yeah, a white dude who's a prog uh, progressive. And then we'll literally just go down all of the dynamics. We'll have, you know, uh, Asians, black people, Hispanic people, uh, name every, uh, MB people, trans people, gay people, or whatever. Literally sit in a room and fucking scream at each other for two hours while drinking alcohol about their problems and the way they see society fucks with like like this is this is community by the way this is exactly what i'm talking about so when you're talking about like creating these spaces this is on you and me literally if you wanted to say hey connor when covid's over i'm coming to america i want you to find the most lefty obnoxious black american who's a black nat nationalist separatist um i'm going to be the conservative female i'll find another conservative male you can be the enlightened centrist we're going to find a progressive and literally we're going to videotape us drinking beer and screaming at each other that would be more politically productive than what we're doing now which is assuming that the conversation can't be held one Connor. more point and then i'll shut up one more point <laughs> so it is harder it is harder to bring everybody up to the idealized version of what a human being could, like should be. And this is where I'm very thankful for my military service. We were incredibly racist to each other. So racist. The black people were picking on the white people, the white people were picking on the black people, the Hispanic people were picking on everybody, and we all loved each other because we were brothers. And despite the fact that we were different, we gave each other shit. So we were forced into a situation in which we had to deal with each other. And despite the fact that we had various levels of disagreement, some of which were irreconcilable, we loved each other. And that's part of what's what being in a liberal republic, that's what part of being in a multi-ethnic, you know, diverse society has to be is fuck you. I don't like you for that, but I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to understand you. And that's where we need to get, go discourse wise. And guess what? I'm going to reject your fucking presupposition that discourse is impossible. Everybody hates you. Do you know, do you know what happened when you tried, when you came back or whatever? Yes, of course. There were a whole bunch of cynical bastards who were like, Lauren is going to try the centrist grift. She's going to, you know, she's going to come back as an enlightened centrist and she's going to start talking to Jordan Peterson and fucking Ben Shapiro again. And she's going to go right into the centrist grift. That's not what you did. You stayed a conservative, right? Because you probably have some internal principles, some principles that you actually hold, which is respectable. But at the same time, if you wanted to get in there and throw elbows from your fucking perspective, I guarantee you, despite some of the edgier shit that you've done in your past, there would be people who would be super willing to get in the fucking ring with you, throw some fucking elbows. And if you drank beer by the end of the night, you might actually like each other. Connor, I would love to do that. Honestly, okay. uh, I'm no, going to hold seriously. you to that. 
well, that's great. You're going to have to talk to the U.S. government about that, though. And this okay. speaks to my entire point I've been making is I'm literally not allowed in America because of my politics right now. So I literally cannot have that conversation. I will come to Australia with those lefties that I would love to do because of my politics. My ability to do these things has been taken away. So I would love to do all these things, but slowly and surely, all of our ability to do them is being taken away. And that is the is primary it, focus of conservatives right now. Is it what you said or is it how you said it? Does it matter? <laughs> yeah, it absolutely does it, does. it absolutely does. Yeah, it absolutely does. So so for instance, I'm going to hit you with it and you can hate me for it, but I'm not, but I'm going to hit you with it. You're so, let, let's just okay. I won't even hit you that hard. I'll say okay. some of your rhetorical strategies <laughs> and some of your PR stunts were a little on the edgy side. Okay, of course. I is would that fair? Agree with you. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Fair. So so some of those edgy rhetorical strategies, more sensitive people really didn't like. And some people blamed for the radicalization that we have now seen in our society. As a matter of fact, I literally saw um, our mutual friend, Destiny, blame um, alternative media personalities for the radicalization that has occurred in American society more than the mainstream media, which I actually disagree with him on, but I still think is an interesting point. So basically, just, just to summarize it, you helped make this mess. It's all of our responsibility to unfuck it. And if you keep hitting me with, well, I just don't think discourse is possible. I just don't think that we can have a conversation. I just don't think these people want to talk to me. I can't even get to the United States. I can't even have a debate with these people. Like, like all, what you're effectively telling me without saying it is that these people are enemies and we have to fight. That's what okay, I'm hearing. I, I don't want to. That's, I'm saying I don't want to. Then stop. They're... Then stop. Then stop and, and, and accept that you're going to have to come back into the discourse and you're going to have to fight these people rhetorically. Okay, I will do that. But I have to ask at what point, it, and I agree, I agree. I, I have this similar hope that you do. And here's something I will give to you. I have this similar hope that we are not past the point of being able to have discourse. There are some people that have absolutely been kicked out of society and are no longer able to. And they would absolutely feel this way. But there is still, I hope, some opportunity to fight back. I hope there are going to be legal battles against Twitter for the banning of conservatives. I hope that people are going to find ways around big tech censorship. I'm talking to someone right now who just created a phone that's on its own blockchain uh, technology, so it can't be censored. You can download Parler to it. I'm hoping that innovation and the want to repair our society is going to win. That is my hope. My concerns, I don't think, are illegitimate, though, and my fears, I don't think, are illegitimate, though. Your and your pain, I will. your pain, and your perspective is not excluded by mine, and my perspective is not excluded by yours. Thank you, Dave Chappelle. But this ser <laughs> seriously, so so the, I, well, wait, I want to hit one this question. Though. I wanted to yeah, ask you. I absolutely. At what point does society get to where you kind of give up the discourse and move to? I don't want to say violence, but like just hardcore legal battle, hardcore, you know, like the kind of stuff Project Veritas does, where this is no longer about discourse. This is about exposing corruption. Never. This is about taking down people that want us dead, which is some some Never. people have literally said they want conservatives dead. They want people that they see as Nazis dead. So you don't get there's no point that you get to where because you said violence if you're in the situation of the Wagers in China. So there must be some in between there where it's like actually no, I you you never reaching out this. No, th this is this is the thing and I hope you agree with this as a Christian. You never give up your principles. You never give in to factionalism or tribalism. You never say that the other side is irredeemable. As a matter of fact, if there's something that's very specific about the Christian ethic, it is that the worst people on the planet are redeemable in the eyes of God. Now, it does that mean that I'm going to let myself be killed? Does that mean that I'm going to let my family get killed? Does that mean that I'm going to allow conservative thought to be purged from the world? Absolutely not. But I'm going to fight that battle in discourse. And then once that, like, and, and by the way, like, I'm not, you know, if anything, like, I'm a liberal, but I have Republican and conservative sentiments, and I'm very pro-gun, which puts me on the right, 
but I have lefty sympathies and I try to steel man them and like all that kind of bullshit. So anyways, I'm a weird person. But the, the point being is you're, you're asking when do we stop? When do we stop extending the hand? You don't. You don't. And, and here, here's the thing. Even in war, even in, in war between ideological opponents who are hell-bent on destroying each other, if you're thinking about World War II, like Japan and the United States or Japan and Germany or whatever, there's still diplomacy going on in the background. When do we stop? When do we stop hurting each other? When do we stop killing each other? When do we try to understand each other? And effectively what's going on here is like um, you, you, you die with your principles. That, 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 that's, really, that's really the fundamental answer. And this, this is kind of what I'm um, horrified by with our society and our politics. And maybe this is, again, me being willing to be thought of as naive. But I'm not giving up my ideals for politics. I'm not giving up my commitment to truth for politics. I'm not giving up my commitment to my worldview for politics. And I'll live and die by this. And that we, if the world would be a better place if more people were willing to live and die while continuing to hold on to their principles and not subscribing to real politic. I think that your view on all of this is a beautiful thing. It's a hopeful thing. It's a message I think a lot of people need to hear. But I fear, once again, it's like everyone in the world would, not everyone, but at least 50% of the world would have to be like you. Mm -hmm. it, like the libertarian ethos. You know, you kind of need a majority of people to believe in the non-aggression principle. Otherwise, you'll just have people create a new gang, a new faction, a new government. Um, adding once again, I think, I think it is good to have those virtues and ideals that you aspire to, and you don't let go of, even in dark times, like you said, even in warfare, you still have the diplomacy going on. I agree. But for me, there is definitely a point where I put down my foot and I say, I will have conversations with you, but I'm not taking your shit and I'm not going to let you, you know, silence and shut down and it, like i'm gonna move i'm gonna move a step up i'm gonna go we need to do legal warfare we need to expose corruption we need to go beyond just the but, but let me the let me ask branches. you this question because because this is important to the framing of the argument so do you do you think that conservatives on social media are being censored for saying that they value their family and that they think family is important? Do you think that they're being censored for saying that they care about free speech or the Republic? Or do you think they're being censored because they're saying Trump lost fraudulently? If you got to go, you got to go. Oh, no, my my husband's got that. On. Oh, one minute. <laughs> <laughs> I OK, so I'm going to talk to you guys for a second. Having a child is a beautiful thing. And even though you hear crying and you know whining and all that kind of stuff, you don't hear that when you're a parent. Effectively, what you hear is, I need you. You don't hear the crying. You hear, I need you. And something inside your caveman DNA effectively says, I need to go take care of that. I need to go love my child. I need to take care of my child. I need to give them a bottle. I need to, you know, I need to burp them. I need to give them a new diaper. I need to entertain them. I will respond to that point about mm. uh, what conservatives are being banned for. And I mm. do think, yeah, there are people. And you know what? I agree. I see some people go on to YouTube or Twitter and they say the N word like 20 times and then are like, I can't believe my voice is being censored. And it's like, you weren't really trying to say anything constructive. There wasn't really, it was kind of just verbal graffiti on the internet. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people are saying, oh, it was just Trump and it's just people that are really right wing. Ron Paul was just banned off Facebook the other day. I don't think what he did. fascist Ron Paul, uh, they just, I, I can't remember exactly. Did, but Did they post really his think... like 1960s article where he was talking about the N-word super hard? Like, dude, was, like, did he repost that shit? And they're like, whoa, Ron Paul, that's against community service. Banned. Like, <laughs> I somehow doubt that was what happened. But, you know, okay. I, I think well, the censorship wave is going to affect everyone. I have been banned sure. and taken off of things just for criticizing pride parades. Not saying they shouldn't was happen, it, okay, but saying but the over-sexualization it... in front of children isn't good. The, 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 to deny actual censorship of just opinions, mm. I think is bad faith. If we're going to talk about how we need to okay. steal man the, the other side. Then I'm, then I'm not, I'm not trying to be bad faith, but do you think that your cumulative, your, your cumulative edgy history might have come home and bit you in the butt a little bit where it wasn't necessarily what you said, but how you said it and your cumulative history? 
Oh, here's the thing. This is what I find so funny is when I think of traditional leftist mm -hmm. ideology, I think of people that would portray themselves as forgiving, wanting to understand, you know, even in the face of terrorism, they ask, but did that person have a difficult childhood? Right. But for some reason, when it comes to conservatives and when it comes to their, their political enemies that are doing back and forth with them, they look at their past and they say, irredeemable, you said something five years ago and therefore your mind cannot have possibly changed. This statement you made five years ago is who you are today and forever because it is politically convenient for me to say that. So when I hear that, oh, did you think your past came back to bite you in the butt? I say, they banned me for something I did in my present. Should we really do this kind of, we're going to go over everyone's history to decide whether or not they should be banned from social media? Because especially if you grew up in the early 2000s, I don't think anyone is surviving that purge. Oh we have God. all said and done things that we regret or don't necessarily agree with today, or maybe you still agree with, which this is a lot of my stuff. I look back at things I did where I'm like, I agree with the sentiment, but I wouldn't do it today because I don't think it was the best political approach or the way I said it was not how I would portray that argument today. And I just think it's, once again, I, I don't think it's a very... So let healthy me, or successful strategy. <laughs> well, and, and you tell me when we got to go, but I want to, I want to say one thing to that, which is basically we, we think of the left and we think that they're this, this, we, we kind of, I, I brought this up in a different conversation, but basically we construct this, uh, like the way that people are afraid of spiders, right? They see a spider, which is like a, you know, a daddy long legs or like, a, you know, just like a generic wolf spider, which is like non-toxic. And they're like, oh, my God, it's a it's a black widow, brown recluse. It's going to melt my flesh and kill me like like it's just going to kill me. Like when, when people have this irrational fear, that's the same way that I view the left, which is like there are lefties. There are tankies, there are anarcho-communists, anarcho there are liberals, there are progressives. And guess what? As much as you hate them and as much as you think they're hypocrites, they all hate each other a lot. And they all think of each other as hypocrites. And there's this intertribal warfare and ideological purity. And this is where I want to point out a conservative talking point. We've lost a Christian ethic. We don't know how to be redeemed. We don't know how to atone. We don't know how to apologize. We don't know how to ask for mercy. We don't know how to be forgiven. So these are these are things that I think the Christian ethic, even if you don't believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior and all that kind of shit, this is an important social mechanism that we have completely lost through the secularization of society. And if you actually wanted to fix society, then you would have to reintroduce that Maybe not as a real, like you have to be Catholic, you have to be Christian in order to understand the conception of forgiveness. No, it's my job and your job as people who were raised conservative to talk to secular people who have no idea about mercy or forgiveness or redemption or atonement or, or, or truth or, or any of these like higher ideal principles to give that to the next generation so they can survive. Because again, like I'm going to beat you up just a little bit. Your, your black pill in your, your hopelessness about discourse or whatever, the alternative is violence. That's the alternative. And we need to be honest about that. The alternative, if we don't figure out how to fix discourse, the alternative is violence and we're already seeing it. So- And, and that is why I hope the censorship stops because I want the conversation to continue. But right now it is not the conservatives causing the censorship. If they were, and when I see it, I will go after them just as hard. And there are things conservatives do that I think are absolutely stupid. Uh, let's like, you just made that point about the idea of redemption. I was just in a big argument with people talking about there is factions of kind of traditionalist movement that say write off anyone who has fallen to worldly sin or slept around, been on Tinder, done all that. Maybe they're a single mother. They've had a life that just has gone awry from what people would consider traditional values they write them off as totally degenerate and irredeemable well we were all raised in this modern world with modern principles and most of us didn't have the privilege of christian homes and good guidance so if you write off all these people as irredeemable degenerates you're not going to have a movement mm -hmm. because that's most of the population these days and it's foolish and silly and once again not in line with christian principle so i have a lot of criticisms within kind of the conservative world as well but the first the first first and most basic part of our politics for it to be able to go forward in a way where we still have a nation, a community, 
groups of people that vote and believe in your republic, you need to have that conversation. And it is not the conservative censoring people right now. One, it is, I'll go after them, but it is the left, it is big mm. tech, it is government, it is uh, Silicon Valley. And right now, I think that is the most important thing to be criticizing so that we can stop the violence. Okay. And I don't so, see, I, I see the left mocking the, the censorship. I see them. And, you know, I laugh sometimes at the memes too. They, they'll they overblow. Everything is 1984. You know, I called my mom a bitch and she told me to go to my room. It's like 1984 and they make fun of it. And I get the memes, but this is actually, like you said, it is so important to stop the censorship before it goes too far. Otherwise, okay. you get violence. Are you, okay, so I'll, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a jerk one more time. So yeah. are you going to punch right? Are you Am gonna, gonna say? Punch right? I do no, hold, punch hold on, hold on, hold on. Are you going to do a twenty-minute or thirty-minute YouTube channel about the evidence that the Trump team has presented in reference to the election fraud and why it hasn't been heard by the courts? Are you going to articulate QAnon and whether, like, what's the true parts of QAnon? So, for instance. Jeffrey Epstein and a whole bunch of uber powerful people were having sex with underage prostitutes on Lolita Island, which is something worth investigating and something worth checking out. And maybe his intelligence service ties are something worth investigating and talking about. Uh, but at the same time, Democrats are probably not specifically kidnapping, you know, underage kids and slaughtering them in demonic rituals in the bottom of a pizza shop. So like, are you going to take on the right wing memes as much as you take on the left wing memes? Because here's the other thing. Nobody fucking listens to the other side. So if I criticize the left right now or whatever, nobody's going to listen to me. Nobody's going to give a shit. Nobody's going to fucking care. They're just going to write me off as some like Nazi dickhead chud who has fucking bad takes on immigrations and bad takes on guns and bad takes on, you know, talking to Lauren Southern and all that bullshit. Um, and they're just going to discount me and they're not going to listen to me at all. But if I talk to conservatives and I say, hey, listen, I might be a commie sympathizing liberal enlightened centrist dickhead but i come from the conservatives and this is what i see going wrong on the conservative side and i'm not going to be a hypocrite about it guess what i have conservatives telling me hey man i was being in, i was being a jerk about it but then i actually called i held myself to the same standard and then it's the same thing with um it's the same thing with lefties and liberals you saying lefties and liberals are hypocrites is going to do nothing. It's going to have no oh, political e inertia. Every, everyone is a hypocrite right now. But, everyone is a hypocrite but, right now. But if you say, hey, I'm Lauren Southern. I'm the fucking person who got 700K fucking subs leading the internet right for fucking two to four years. I have made strong right, right wing documentaries. My credentials are nearly impeccable, but I'm going to call out bullshit on the right and I'm going to try to make the right better. You lefty scumbag communist dickheads who keep on basically making the world a worse place. If I'm going to hold my people accountable, you hold your people accountable. And then that becomes a place of moral virtue on which you can actually strike the other side and call them out on their own hypocrisy but until you until you take care of your own lunatics nobody's going to listen to you and nobody's going to listen to me i i was just doing a podcast the other day you can go listen to it on itunes um and we were talking about the QAnon ridiculousness. We were talking about all of this stuff. And I even discussed how when I came out initially, I literally just criticized the riots going on at the Capitol. And I was like, yes, I'm, I have been consistent this entire time. The riots from BLM have been horrible and I disagree with the riots at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And then what I saw was just this mass wave of mainstream media, leftists, politicians, celebrities going, Yes, aren't you horrible? You guys, I can't believe you're rioting. I can't and I saw no consistency from the other side. So of course the natural reaction is, well, screw this. Like well, I'm being such a schmuck. I'm just sitting here mm -mm. being consistent. Well You're not being a schmuck. So so what I did, I what I did was then I just dedicated my time to calling out that hypocrisy. No. Because otherwise you're just gonna see a wall of nothing wrong, nothing wrong, nothing wrong when the left messes up and mm -hmm. a wall of everything wrong, everything wrong, everything wrong when the right messes up oh. instead. And that, that's, you saw, I'm look gonna... at the riots. Were, were the BLM riots mm -hmm. disavowed by both parties? The riots at the Capitol were disavowed by Republicans and Democrats unanimously. You Can you name a large kind of mainstream conservative or Republican figure that didn't say they were wrong? I can't. I can name a million mainstream figures on the left that encouraged the BLM riots. Are we it's holding not, Trump accountable? You are, 
Trump literally said, go home and be peaceful, and okay. then was banned from and, Twitter. And in the same conversation, he insisted that the election was stolen from him. Do, do, do you understand like you how can, you large can say, of an insinuation that is? That's effectively saying that we no longer live in a democratic republic. We live in a banana republic. We live in a democracy that is no longer a democracy. And if you allow these pedophile demon rats to run society effectively you are going to be a slave to them for the rest of history because we no longer live in a democracy connor, connor and the media told everyone for years that donald trump said neo-nazis were very good people and we both mm. know that is a lie should they all be banned from twitter because to convince the entire public that your president loves neo-nazis is to also say the same thing that you're living under a hitlerian dictatorship in fact they said that russians stole the election should everyone that said russians stole the election be kicked off twitter be for inciting chaos and riots which also happened when trump was inaugurated this is it's it's the inconsistency that is driving people crazy it's driving me crazy you are holding republicans to a higher standard than you are holding left in fact not you necessarily but no i am <laughs> you are right Actually, you are correct I am holding Republicans to a higher standard. I am holding the people that I emanate from, from to a higher standard. I am calling out the bullshit on my side. Because the thing about it is, you don't fucking, th this is, this is, uh, honestly, I look forward to the Destiny 2.0 debate. So this is uh, specifically about Russiagate. It's going to be phenomenal. So anyways, the fucking, the, the point is that when your side does something fucked up. When Donald Trump insists that we no longer live in a democracy, when uh, Donald Trump basically says everything except for literally break glass and storm the fucking, uh, storm the Capitol. When fucking Republicans say, Trump did oh, not say we, that. hold on, hold on, hold on. We, we abhor the violence. We abhor the violence. Um, but at the same time, you know, maybe the election was stolen. Uh, and we're, by the way, we're not going to impeach Donald Trump and we're not going to hold him accountable. So when you, or when we do that, when the right does that, the, the solution or the answer is not to say, but the lefties, this is two kids sitting in the back of a car that's being yelled at by mom. Oh yeah, I stuck gum in your hair, mom. But did you see what Sarah did? Sarah punched me in the eye 20 seconds ago. No, that's not, it, it's, it's, it's the prisoner's dilemma. It's political naivete. It's fucking, and it's toxic. It's toxic. People have already died as a result of this rhetoric. And frankly, like, I like you. I respect you. I think you're a smart person. I think you're fucking deadly, but it, it, rhetorically. But at the same time, I want you to, like, I'm going to push you. As long as we have a relationship, I'm going to push you. And I'm going to push you to say, okay, lefty's fucked up. Got it. Let's talk about it. Let's punch left. Let's talk about how they're fucked up. But when the right is fucked up, the, the answer is not, oh, but the left is also fucked up. The, the answer is, yes, the right is fucked up and we're going to hold our people to a higher standard. We're going to hold the right wing movement to a higher standard. We're going to win on our ideals. We're going to come up with good rhetoric. We're going to come up with good memes. We're not going to treat people like trash. Because here's the other thing about having a Christian ethic. The Christian ethic is not created for straight, normal people. It's made for drug addicts. It's made for whores. It's made for degenerates. It's made for bad people. It's made for people who don't know how to forgive. It's made for people who don't know how to live a good life. That's what Christian morality is for. And if you don't tell them about it, and if you don't put it in a package that they can consume, even if they don't believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's the Messiah come again, if you don't tell them how to forgive, if you don't tell them how to turn the other cheek, if you don't teach them about mercy or redemption, or forgiveness or, or, or how to love your enemies, then that this is what happens. This is what happens. Atheists have said for years that we can hollow out the Christian ethic from Western societies and we will not pay any kind of social consequence. And we are seeing in real time that that is bullshit. So I don't care if any of my viewers believe that uh, Jesus Christ himself is the Messiah. You need to understand the Christian ethic and how it creates a civilized society. And yeah, that we can absolutely agree there. Okay. Yeah, I just I once I do disagree with the way you're portraying it because I will say when I approached the riots once again it was yes something was done wrong here, but until the other side admits that they have also done something wrong, they're not going, going to. to.
you're not going to exactly. And I am going to try to make sure because the problem actually isn't the people that are having these little squabbles on Twitter and back and forth. Mm -hmm. It's the wider society that is watching and being completely gaslit into believing this is neo-Nazis versus saints. And that's a very, nobody, nobody's buying this. And, and, And you, you know, I see people, I see people that do it. I see people that I went to high school with posting things that are just like NPC tier delusional believe everything they read from the media and it's not it's not healthy it's did not you, helping society it's did, not healing society did you know that 25 percent of the population doesn't have an internal monologue <laughs> i'm serious like I, i'm definitely repeating memes i definitely don't have a study to submit to you but um you know if somebody asked me for a study i don't have it but i think it's something worth googling a large chunk of the population does not have an internal monologue they are literal npcs so for you to say that I have friends or former friends from high school who are NPCs, my exact reaction is going to be, yeah, they exist. <laughs> you, Way you, to dehumanize people, Connor. I like right. to think there is. I'm a bad person. You <laughs> caught me. Like, like that's 100%. Like you caught me. I, I'm a bad person. I have to look into that because that actually is blowing my mind even thinking about that. I don't want to see anyone as an actual NPC. So I'm going to just choose to ignore that fact. Okay. All right. Fair true. enough. <laughs> Fair enough. It's but, um, it's a it's a my, horrifically inconvenient fact. It's really bad. Like it's my. I hope I hope really, it's real. Otherwise, I'm just spouting off garbage for like. No well, yeah, Connor. My my feelings care a lot. Uh, do not care about your facts right now. That's so, fine. That's fine. It's gonna be um, it's gonna be one of those things that's gonna be in the back of your head, and like six months from now, you're gonna be like, shit, was he lying or not? And then you're gonna Google it, and then you're gonna find some weird study, and you're just gonna be like, shit, like. But, you know, sometimes I you am do have conversations with, with people where it does feel like it is like script responses. To there's everything there's no lights on inside. Yeah, but I, I like to just think they're they're having an off day or it's not something they're passionate about. So they're just, mm-hmm. yeah, no, but, I'm, I'm, I, I'd prefer to believe that. So my, uh, my feelings are not going to care about your facts. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the noble lie. It's the noble lie that NPCs do not walk among us. That's something that we have to continue to believe. <laughs> All right. Well, my son uh, really wants to play right now. Of course. He's, uh, he's just going full antifa on my studio. All right. So, uh, but... you mind if we do? Uh, you mind if we do outros? That way, we can uh, chop it yeah, up. Yeah, and... of course. Okay. All right. So, if you enjoyed this conversation, my name is Connor. I run a YouTube channel named Counterpoints. If you actually type it into YouTube, it will be the first channel that's there. And yes, it is small, but I like to think that I entertain the people that I do have. If you would like to come on by, if you want to argue with me, I'm also on Twitter. You can, Lauren sometimes will tweet me or quote tweet me or whatever. Um, so you can you can find me there as well at Counterpoints, C-O-N-O-R-P-O-I-N-T-S. Um, you know, I'm ready for you. Come. Come, come and let's fight it out. <laughs> yeah, make sure to relentlessly bully him for being a radical centrist. Just send him thousands That is targeted of harassment. <laughs> I am going to get you banned from Twitter. This is it. I'm only this saying is done. That, I'm only saying that so that they'll stop bullying me. <laughs> me a radical centrist. Fair enough. Uh, Fair yeah. enough. No, this, this a was good a good, productive conversation. I hope one day uh, I'm not banned from every country and banished to live in the sea so we can have those beers and scream at each other on live stream I will, one day destiny vosh you me uh like fanatic or i'm trying to think of like another uh cat black uh faraday speaks someone else that's conservative <laughs> all right well let's wrap this up uh really good lessons here bullying is great uh we're doomed to violence i hope you guys all learned something no 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 Uh, i do like connor's more hopeful view of the world and i do hope it's not too late for discourse but i fear we we are getting close to that point and i hope that everyone works their hardest to take us back from that edge while we still have this last sliver of hope left that we could potentially achieve Anyways, thank you so much for having this conversation, Connor. I hope you guys enjoyed it and I will see you next time.